Hello, everybody at Sun Baptist Church. Well, here we are on the Lord's Day. Go ahead and look in your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 7. And today I'm going to be talking about what to tell somebody who needs to get out of a mess. <laughs> it may be you. It may be you. There may be some time in your life either today or in the future, you'll need to remind yourself of how to get out of a mess, or maybe you'll need to be able to tell somebody else. While you're looking for 2 Kings chapter 7, here we go again. Let me give you a quick update of where I am concerning this continuing issue with my prostate cancer. Well, we made application to my insurance company that's with Medicare, and they turned it down. I'm with Humana. Then we made an appeal. They turned the appeal down. Made another appeal. They turned it down. So, finally, I had no alternative except to somehow do something to get this thing resolved. So I had the Proton Institute because I want them to do it because Tom Bass is so high on them. I, I want them to do it. Even if they can't do the Proton type, I want them to do at least the traditional kind. And they said they could, the traditional kind of radiation. So they contacted the insurance company. They said, fine, we're going to do it. But in order to do that, because a Cologuard test came back positive, I've got to have a colonoscopy, and uh, that means going to University of Florida Hospital, letting them load me down with that clotting factor. I'm not really anxious for them to do that, because if you'll remember five years ago in 2018, uh, they found as a result of a colonoscopy, I had to have some uh, precancerous polyps removed, and even with the clotting factor inside of my body, there was a time I almost bled to death. So we're trying to make sure that doesn't happen this time, obviously, but that'll be the first thing. Then they'll, at the same time, embed some markers into the prostate gland. And then finally, the 41 treatments will start. When will that happen? I do not know. I'm expecting a call on Tuesday because Monday is a national holiday, Martin Luther King Day. So on Tuesday, I'm expecting a call to give me a date. That's all that I know, dear friends. I know that you're praying. I hope that you'll continue to pray that this will work out just fine. I hope you'll do that. Now, 2 Kings chapter 7 has a very interesting story in it. And it has a story that is applicable to people everywhere today that either they themselves are in a no-win situation or they have loved ones in a no-win situation because that can apply to people who are young, middle-aged, or old. But in particular, I'm thinking about young people because a lot of times young people find themselves caught up in a situation and really don't know how to get out or perhaps don't really have a desire to get out of that situation. So if you're a parent or a grandparent or even a great grandparent, though this message may not uh, apply to you personally, I think you might want to take some notes because you never can tell, but you might run into somebody that it could give them some assistance. In this story, in 2 Kings chapter 7, and I'm going to read it in just a minute, at least some of it, you're going to learn about four men that had leprosy, and as a result of leprosy, which was a very dreaded disease in those days, they are in a situation they are going to die unless something happens. They are in a no-win situation. So let's look at 2 
Kings chapter 7 and verse 3. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate of the city. And they said one to another, why sit we here until we die? There it is. No win situation. We're sitting out here. We're not allowed to go into the city. We're unclean. Verse 4, if we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now, therefore, come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. Here the city in Israel has been surrounded by the Syrians. There is a famine in the city. These men, these four leprous men say, we are starving to death. So here's our dilemma. If we go into the city, well, there's a famine over there. They're starving too. We're just going to change the location where we die. So if we go over there, we're going to die. If we stay here, we're going to die. But now the enemy of Israel, the Syrians, they've got the city surrounded. They are the enemy. If we go to where they are, I would say if I really looked at this, I would say, and I happen to be one of these four men, I'd say they'll probably kill us. But they said in verse 4, let us fall under the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. In other words, we're going to die anyway. This will just hasten it. Now, that is a really bad situation in which to find yourself. If we stay where we are, we're going to die. If we go to the place presumably where our friends are, we're going to die. Because they're starving to death too. Our only hope is to go somewhere we really don't want to go. We don't want to go to the Syrians. But that's the only hope we got. So the Bible says in verse 5, And they rose up in twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink, and carried thence silver and gold and raiment, and went and hid it. And came again and entered into another tent, and carried thence also, and went and hid it. Then they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. So they came and called unto the porter of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied and asses tied and the tents as they were. So here is a very interesting story. Four lepers. Four lepers. Leprosy was a dread disease. Fingers fell off. Toes fell off. The nose fell off. And more than that, they were not allowed to be around anyone else. And if 
they saw somebody coming from a distance, they had to cry aloud about themselves, unclean, 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 so that that person would not approach them. And here they are. They're in a terrible situation. There were lepers' cities or lepers' camps all over the known world at that time. And these lepers, <coughs> excuse me, had no choice but to live with each other. They could not leave, live with mainstream people. So what are we going to do? <coughs> Excuse me for my cold. I've also come down with a cold as well as my other problems. There are four things they did that I want you to write down. I want you to remember them. They are things that you may have to do, but at the age of the people who hear this program, by and large, you won't have to do it. But you may have children or grandchildren, as I said a while ago. Four things to do when you're in a no-win situation in your life. Number one, just be honest about your predicament. You're going to have to be honest about your predicament. You're just going to have to be honest about it. And you're going to have to see that it has limitations. Now, I want to talk about young people for a minute. Because my heart goes out to young people. Young people, and when I say young people, I'm not just talking about children. I'm talking about teenagers and young adults in their 20s, maybe even their early 30s. These young people are living in a world that is going to create a no-win situation for them. Because you see, this, the devil is a master manipulator. And he has come to steal, to hurt, to destroy, to kill. And it doesn't matter about the young person. It may be a young person who has never had any religious training, makes no claims of being a Christian, or it could be a young person that has been faithful in church attendance, studies the Bible, has a very godly mother, father, grandmother, grandfather, all very godly people. The fact of where they are in their lives spiritually does not keep the devil from attacking them as viciously as he can. And quite often, if you've ever tried to talk to a younger person, again, I'm talking about teenagers and young adults, it's almost an impossibility to get them to see when they are in a no-win situation that it is indeed a no-win situation. You just can't see it. But that day will inevitably come. It will always inevitably come. And quite often, it's too long in coming for your own benefit. You would rather it come much quicker. But it will inevitably come when they begin to suffer because of bad choices they made that kept them in that no-win situation. Now, we don't know how these lepers got leprosy. Don't have any idea. Is it possible they made a bad choice? The law said to stay away from people that had leprosy. It was a dangerous disease that lepers had to cry unclean. Was it possible? They had friends, close friends, maybe family members that had leprosy. But they wanted to be with them. They wanted to play with them, to work with them. And so as a result of that, and it was a bad choice, they themselves now had leprosy. Sometimes people, I'd say most of the time, are in a no-win situation because they made a bad choice. Now that doesn't often, that doesn't always happen. There are those times that we all will make decisions in our lives that are outstanding decisions, well-thought-out decisions, 
but because of somebody else making a bad decision, we suffer for it. For example, we take all the safeguards about our driving, but somebody else is driving down the highway, they don't take the necessary safeguards for safe driving. They're drunk. They've been out to a club. They hit your automobile. You end up in the hospital, maybe with injuries for the rest of your life. Wasn't anything you did, wasn't a choice you made, but you still paid for it. So our lives in terms of finding ourselves in no-win situations will almost always be a result of our own bad decisions or the bad decisions of other people. But whatever it is, there we are. Now, here's the thing. You can't ever allow yourself, and when you're talking to a younger person, remind them of this. You can't let yourself get to the place that you lie to yourself and try to convince yourself that it's really not that bad after all. Well, you're listening to that old fuddy-duddy preacher, Harold Hunter. Or you're listening to some old fuddy-duddy preacher on television. Or you're listening to sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so or an aunt or an uncle. You're listening to everybody but me. And I am telling you, it's not a bad situation, Daddy. It's not a bad situation, Mama. I'm all right. Don't worry about me. I'm going to tell you something. When a person is in a no-win situation, they're going to stay in it as long as they keep lying to themselves that it's not all that bad after all. Remember, the prodigal son was in the pig pen and stayed in that pig pen till one day he woke up. The Bible says he woke up to himself and said to himself, the people back home, that work for my daddy, have it a lot better than I do. I'm out here trying to eat the food that is fed to pigs. They don't, they don't live that way back at daddy's house. I'm going to go back. I'm going to repent. I'm going to ask my daddy to forgive me. I'm in a no-win situation, and there he was until he admitted the limitations of where he was and quit lying about it. I mean, you just got to quit lying about it and saying it's it's really not all that bad. My mother had an old-fashioned Singer sewing machine with a foot treadle. Do you remember those? Yep, she sure had one. It had belonged to her mother. Well, you say... Preacher, I guess you watched your mother make clothes on that, didn't you? Nope. I don't recall her ever using it to make clothes. I don't recall it. I, I, I just don't recall it. It had the pretty little crocheted dollies on top of it. It had a lamp on top of it. It was in a corner of our dining room. Actually, she was using that thing as a side table. It wasn't performing the function that had been created to perform, that of being a sewing machine. She had turned that thing into a side table. Now listen to me, folks. Don't be something you're not. You're in a no-win situation. Admit that you're in a no-win situation and that God didn't create you to be in a situation like that. He just didn't. He didn't create you to be a side table when you're a singer sewing machine. He didn't create you to be a loser. Tell those people that. You were created and you were designed of God. Not to be an alcoholic. Not to be on drugs. 
You were created for something special. And, and God does not place his children in situations in which if you stay there, you're going to die. Look at them and say, just look them in the face and say, if you stay where you are, where are you going to be in another five years, 10 years, maybe one year, maybe six months? Where are you going to be? These four men said, we're going to die. That's what's going to happen to us. We're going to die. So the first thing is don't lie to yourself. If you're in a no-win situation, don't lie to yourself. Admit to yourself, I'm in a no-win situation. There are limitations. I'm not going anywhere. If I stay where I'm at, I'm going to die. My life is going to die. If I don't die physically, my hopes and my dreams and my aspirations, they're going to die of having a good family having a good wife, having a good husband, all of those dreams are going down the tube. If I stay where I'm at, I'm going to die. The second thing is, they needed to get with the right crowd. These four were with the right crowd. Now, in Samaria where they were, <clears throat> it's estimated there were 30,000 people population at that time and at that time, about 4% of the people would have leprosy. That means 900 people had leprosy. 900 people out of 30,000, that's 4% of the 30,000. Now, out of that 900, here are only four people that said, we are going to be unsatisfied with this no-win situation. That means there were 896 other lepers that were satisfied to stay where they are and die. Stay where they are and die. These four were together. The second thing is you better get with the right crowd. If you're going to get out of a no-win situation, you've got to, you've got to quit hanging around the guys down at the pool hall, you got to quit hanging out with the people at the clubs. You got to quit hanging out with those that don't love God. Quit hanging out with those that hate Jesus. Quit hanging out with those that hate the church. Quit hanging out at all the R-rated movies. You got to get a crowd that wants it to be different. You're going to become like the people with whom you associate. Do you remember what your grandma said? Birds of a feather flock together. One of the really good reasons of getting with a Bible-believing church like Sun Baptist is this. Hebrews 10.25 says, Forsaking not the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, things are getting bad and the day is approaching and Jesus is coming, but we're in a rough world. And one of the reasons we need to have a get together on Sunday, it's sort of like a huddle on a football field. We just need to get our plans together and we need to encourage one another. <coughs> you don't need to have friends that will keep you in this no-win situation. Here they were. Four men that had leprosy, they're together in it. They're dissatisfied with having leprosy. There were 896 other men with leprosy that obviously were satisfied staying where they are. I am telling you, if you want out of the situation you're in, make sure, make sure, make sure that you surround yourselves with winners. And winners are those that love God, that have a passion for God and a passion for the Word of God. Number one, don't lie to yourself. No, if you stay where you are, your dreams are going to die. Your hopes for the future are going to die. Your aspirations are going to die. And you may die physically. How many young people do do we have to hear about committing suicide because of lost dreams and hopes? 
How many do we have to hear about overdosing before we get it? There is a no-win situation. And number two, to start getting out of that situation, get with the right crowd. Before they even left that leper's camp there, the four of them had agreed, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do it together, and we're getting out of this situation. The third thing that every person needs to understand in a no-win situation, you deserve better than that. Don't let the devil convince you that you're not worth it. You're worth it. You're worth a better life than you're getting. You're worth more than you're getting from the devil. You don't deserve to be in that no wins. Even if you made stupid decisions, you don't deserve to be in that situation. Why? Because Jesus loved you enough to die for you. That's why. If he loved you enough to die for you, why in the world are you going to be satisfied? Do you think he would have died for you, paid the ultimate sacrifice if you weren't more valuable than where you are right now? He loves you. And the minute you take a step to get out of that situation, he's going to be right there with you. Number one, don't lie to yourself. Know you're in a no-win situation. Get around the right people. And those people better love God because they'll have the roadmap. The roadmap is the Bible. And number three, encourage yourself by knowing Jesus loved you enough to die for you. If he loved you enough to die for you, he'll love you enough to take you by the hand and take you the rest of the way. And the fourth thing, move by faith when it looks like it's frightening and impossible. Move by faith when it looks like it's frightening and impossible. Look what the Bible says in verse 5. And they rose up at twilight. That's dusk. It's dark. It's just after the sun's gone down. Shadowy figures out there. You can't tell whether it's men or trees. You can't really tell the right direction. But you've got God on your side. And when you start moving out of a no-win situation, sometimes you don't know exactly the right step to take the next step, what to do on the next day, but God is with you, and he's directing you. And you've got your friends with you, and you've got faith, and that faith will carry you through. You need to tell young people that. You need to encourage them about that. God's never going to let you down. Living by faith living every day by faith, walking in faith, trusting him every step of the way. I know it's dark outside. It's dusky dark. But you're going to make it. You're going to make it all the way. And when they got to the enemy camp, they learned something. I want you to see something that, that they learned. I think this is so exciting. Verse 6, For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and the horses and so forth. The leader of the Assyrians, the enemy, that, th that these four men feared so much, God had, as it were, for him to hear an army coming at him. Somebody said, do you think that was a dream? No, I don't think it was a dream. What do you think it was? I think it was an army of angels. Yes, sir. These people that have been in a no-win situation, these four lepers, they couldn't see, but they had an army of angels that were lined up there waiting for them just to make the right decision. You or your grandson, granddaughter, son or daughter, or friends, whoever the younger people are. There's an army of angels just waiting for them to make up their mind. I'm getting out of this situation. I'm trusting God. Tell them, encourage them. God has the angels that will frighten your enemies away from you. He'll scatter your enemies. Those no good friends that you think are your friends but are really your enemies just waiting to take you for whatever you they can get out of you. 
God knows who they are. He'll get rid of them. He'll get rid of all the problems, every single problem. The recipe for getting out of a mess is found right here in this story. Admit you're in a mess. Admit you're in a mess. You can do that, can't you? Admit you're in a mess. Get with the right crowd. Just get with the right crowd. You can do that. Know that you deserve better. Jesus died for you. You're worth something. And then just know, when you're moving, making steps away from that treacherous place you are, it may seem dark. But God has a way made for you. And he got an army of angels out there that will make a way for you. And you'll have victory. Isn't that a great lesson? Isn't that a great lesson? That's one of the greatest practical lessons that I've ever shared with you. Whenever you have friends and loved ones, or you, and you're in a no-win situation, try what I've just shared. It'll work. Heavenly Father, thank you that you always make a way. In Jesus' name, amen.